Well, what I said is I certainly want to thank uh, Dr. Kavanaugh for putting together for the third time what I really consider very excellent uh, symposia for us to really look at health care, transparency, advocacy, and reform. He's a very, been very, this is something he's been very concerned about for a very long time. I think we all know, and we've heard many times repeated this morning, that first of all, health care is more than absence of disease. Our health is more than absence of disease. It's about all those things that go on, go on around us, about schools, about churches, about friends, about our community, and the things that we have to know. So all of those social determinants that very much influence our health a as we know it. One of the things that we have to know is, first of all, we do not have a health care system in the United States. We have a very expensive sick care system. The sicker you are, the better we doctor. And, and I think we, we need to understand that. You know, we all, everybody in the United States get sick care. It's just a matter of when you get it. You know, you know people aren't going to, we aren't going to see somebody dying out there in the middle of the street and not get them over to the hospital and they not get seen. Well, we have to know that we pay for that. The other morning someone called me and they said, oh, Dr. Ellis, we don't, everybody can go to the emergency room and we, that don't cost nothing. <laughs> can you imagine the most expensive treatment in the world that we get is people are thinking, that don't cost anything. So I'm saying that I think that we need to stop and begin to rethink. The other thing, we've heard, just heard about some of the very wonderful systems that are out there. You've just heard excellent speakers this morning. I've learned a lot. But one of the things I think that it, we, some of the systems or countries that we think are coming out with the cheapest system and everything's looking great is the one thing they've got is an educated populace. We have a health illiterate society. And we don't want to educate our young people. 50% of the people that are in the hospital in Lexington this morning are there because they didn't take the medicines right. So I think we've got to begin to educate our young people and educate our patients on how to take care of themselves. You can't educate people that aren't healthy, but you sure can't keep them healthy if they aren't educated. And I think that that's a major problem that we're beginning, that we're are dealing with. Did I push the wrong button? I must be. Kevin, you need to come back and tell me, you, t you tell me which one to push. Oh. Oh, I'm, I was pushing in the wrong direction. I'm sorry. <laughs> See, I don't, I, I'm a mechanical idiot. <laughs> but let's look for a, a minute of all the things that I just mentioned about the social determinants framework. You know, we've been talking about disparities in health care. We all know that the people, you know, that the people at the top of the economic ladder have better health than those at the bottom. We all know that the generals in the army who supposedly get the same health care, end up with better health than the private. And we know, so we, and that's true through, throughout. But when we think about the social and economic policies that are they're, they're driving health care, well, just think of the social determinants. Think about health care. That's a very small part of what we're talking about in keeping us healthy. Education. For as I'm concerned, the most important determinant of how healthy our country is and how healthy countries are is related to education. We know what about housing. We know if you live in sorry housing, you're going to have poor health. Well, the physical environment, our work environment, our income, transportation. We know that people who live in rural areas very often have poor health because they can't get to the doctor. You know, so. And well, we have all those isms that we carry around on our back that's in our society. The, our criminal justice system, all of those problems influence what goes 
on and of course our individual behaviors. You know, you can't keep me healthy if I'm out there smoking and drinking and drugging and not taking care of my sexual health. So those are all problems in how well, how healthy I'm going to be. And of course, you know, our genetics. None of us can determine what our genetics, we, you know, that's in there and we can't change that and we have to just live with it. But all of that very much influence our health outcome. So in the uh, World Health Organization, looked at some of the things that was true about health. They evaluated the world's health all over. And they said there are two truisms about health, regardless to what? The rich countries have better health than poor countries, and medical care improves health. Well, you know, I don't think we, we, they have to do a big study to tell us that. But be that as it may, but when they did the big study, that was, that was the thing that they found to be true. I won't go into the top 10 public health achievements in the past 100 years, but we all know that they're there and it's the things that do, and it's felt that 25% of the improvement that we've had to increase our lifespan and improve our health has been very much related to public health as opposed to the 25% were related to the, the uh, things that we as doctors have learned, the scientists, that have very much improved uh, the overall, our overall health, like heart transplants and kidney transplants. All of those things have been helpful, but it's only made a difference of 25% of the improvement that we've seen in healthcare, and the other 75% was related to Things like immunizations, and we're all panicked now about H1N1, and, but, but it's immunization, safe, motor vehicle safety, and, uh, and control of infectious diseases, uh, and healthier foods, family planning, and recognizing tobacco as a disease. We all know the goals of 2010. We've increased the length of healthy life for all Americans. We know that. We've done, we've done little. There's been a widening of the gap when we can come to eliminating health disparities, and we've certainly not provided access to primary preventive health care for all of our people. You know, we, when Canada was talking about two-hour wait times, I bet you couldn't go into any emergency room in this city today and wait two hours and get out in the emergency room, unless Lexington is a lot different than Little Rock. So, but we see, and you know, and when they were talking about the times to see a specialist, you know, what, you know, the, it's very different from city to city and what you're needing to see someone about and what it's all about. Let's talk for just a second about the brief history of health care reform. We've been trying to pass health care reform since 19, literally, since 1908. Teddy Roosevelt was the first one to really try to pass health care reform, and that's when we ended up with the Federal Employees Workman's Compensation. He tried again in, uh, in 1912, he lost the election. Uh, Franklin Roosevelt tried to pass national health insurance. He failed and we got the New Deal. He tried again uh, in uh, reducing the second Bill of Rights and saying the people should have a right to health care, and that died with Roosevelt. Truman tried. And we called, said, well, he was trying to socialize medicine, and of, of that failed. And of course, then we had the Korean War. Kennedy tried. Johnson uh, tried, uh, passed the Medicare and Medicaid. Uh, and he, you know, I think that that was because Johnson was a slick politician, and that's what, yeah, and that's what we need right now. We're going to pass health care and get de a real decent health care bill passed. You know, I mean, uh, you know, the many things he knew how to, he knew how to get the bills passed. So, uh, and, and of course, uh, uh, Mr. Nixon, uh, you know, we ended up with HMOs and PPOs and well, that uh, is, I always said that what we, what we did is we improved, you know, maybe that was the cost, but it wasn't about improving health care. Carter, he tried to get health insurance, and that went down. Clinton, well, you know, I was there when we worked on the Health Security Act. Again, we're still trying to pass sick care 
we haven't really tried to pass health care in this United States. And we, we, we did get shipped. And of course, now we are, you've heard an uh, 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 excellent discussion of the uh, House bill. And you'll hear more about other bills that are coming along. And of course, you've heard about the single payer this morning. And the thing of it is, we're still not talking about how do we deliver health care. As I said, we're the best in the world at delivering sick care. But we have not developed a plan for looking at health care. Some of the truisms about health care in the United States. Well, you've heard we spend more money than anybody else. We've said we're the richest country in the world. I don't know whether we are anymore or not. We probably owe more debt than anybody else right now. But uh, we still have a shorter lifespan. You look at our health, we're not healthier. Our infant mortality rate is higher. You know, I, walked, I used to walk around when they, you know, black infant mortality rate, they were saying 6.4% or something, 6.2%. The black infant mortality rate is 14%. So I used, to, I used to walk around and say, well, that's because we're poor and less well-educated and all that. Well, the Hispanic infant mortality rate in the United States is better than white infant mortality rate in the United States. So I, I had to stop that lie. So I don't know what it is. <laughs> we know that smoking is on the decline. It used to be 56%. It's down to 21%, but I understand it went up just a smidgen last year. Well, of course, you know, as I tell people all the time, when I was working hard in the fields and chopping cotton and all that stuff, I was sleek and thin and wonderful. Now that I sit around and talk about, uh, you know, talk about things, I've, got, I've, I've gotten wider, but I didn't grow any taller. So we know that 67% of our society is overweight. That is, they have a BMI greater than 30, uh, uh, 30 whereas 30% of us are fat like me. That is, we're re literally obese. We've had some improvements in the preventable causes of death, but we still have 47 million people out there with no health insurance. And we have a lot of disparities in health care. And I've mentioned to you what the World Health Organization, World, when they looked at all the health systems in the world, looking at the level of population health, the disparities, health, how responsive we were. The only thing we were number one in was in spending. Number 31 out of 151 countries according to performance, number 54 in overall fairness, and number 72 in our performance. The major social determinants of, how, of our health 50% of social and behavioral, that's our drinking, our eating, our lack of exercise, all those things that we have control over. Our environment, none over our genetics, and only 10% of our health is determined by access to care. We have a population of 306 million people, 14% uh, of 41.1 are African Americans. That was in 208. We have a, we are the most diverse society in the world. 69% are white. 12.4% African American. 13.6% Hispanic. 3% Asian, and less than 1% Native Americans. I think I'm going in the wrong direction. Let me, okay. Time Magazine earlier this year put in a, a review of America's health checkup. Probably most of you saw this, but what it said is that the, our population, we've already talked, was over 300 million. 39 million are over 65, and those of us who are over 65, we're proud about that. And 27% have high blood pressure, 40% of us get little or no exercise, and 83%, 83% do not eat five fruits and vegetables every day. So why do we, our health care cost is increasing because we're increasing number of old folk like me. 
We're living longer, and I mentioned I'm proud about that. We have a greater burden of chronic disease, things like uh, obesity, things like obesity. It said that 57 million people in America have pre-diabetes. Out of our 300 million, 57 million have diabetes or pre-diabetes. And much of that is related because we got wider instead of taller. We have a much greater burden of chronic disease. We use more medications. Our technology, you heard, for making diagnoses have greatly improved. We have a higher rate of hospitalizations. Increased use of nursing facilities, that's what, that's what it's saying, but that's not true anymore. In fact, we thought we were going to use more nursing facilities, but I want you to know that um, more of our elderly are staying home. More people are taking care of their families in their own homes, and so nursing home facilities are beginning to go down a little bit. 40% once we get over 85 need some help with the activities of daily living, and uh, our administrative cost, as you heard, is extremely high. You know, lack of health insurance, we think, well, what difference does it make if you don't have any health insurance? Well, it can be deadly. We have more than 45,000 people who die each year because of lack of health insurance. We have a widening. You know, we, we're talking about all the people who are getting richer and making more money. Well, we've had a widening of the gap between the rich and the poor, and especially for our children. 25% of the children born in America are less than 25% of the federal poverty rate. 50%, 49.9% of the African American children. We have the rising healthcare expenditure as a percent of the gross domestic product. It was 5% in 1960, 16% in 207, and I understand it's heading toward 18 to 20%. Yet, and we have a rising number of people over 85. When you, and that means that we're going to have increasing numbers of people with Alzheimer's. And when we get to, once you, we have a 1% of the people over 65 have Alzheimer's, and then it increases by 4% every five years after that. And you know, when we have Alzheimer's, that's not one person, that's at least two. I think I've already said that, let me, uh, in the fastest growing segment are the people that are over 65, increasing number of minorities. The minority population was 20% in 1980, projected to be 50%. We're by 2050. And the number of older Americans, I've just mentioned, in 1900, it was 3.1 million. Right now, it's 30, I told you it was 39.9 million, so it was 40 million there. And by 2050, Again, I'm proud about that. I, that means I might live, live then. It would be 71.5 million. And I'm good, I've just told you about obesity being such a major problem, but look, at, look how much obesity has increased in our country. From, in 1976, it was 12.8%. In 2007, it's up to 34% of our population. And we know that that increases the risk of heart disease, diabetes, cancer, stroke, all of those things. The thing we can say about healthcare in America, first, and you've heard all morning, it's not coherent, it's not comprehensive. You know, we think we've got choice, but our choice is after somebody else picks. I can guarantee you at most of the places where you're employed, you get to choose from what somebody else has already picked. It's not, you know, you don't go, well, few people can go out, but very few people go out and just buy their in, insurance, uh, truly. We know it's not cost effective. I've told you how much we're spending. 16 to 17% of our gross domestic product. We aren't the healthiest people in the world. We know it's not equitable. And we certainly know that it's not universal, that all of our people certainly do not have access to healthcare. And I am one of those people, I truly believe 
that health care should be a human right, and it should not be a commodity. And if we can brag about having the best army, the best uh, defense equipment, but you never hear us brag about having the best health care system. And I think it's time we work on our health care system. I'm not talking about our doctors now. If you get real sick and get to the doctor, heaven knows I think this is the best place in the world to be. But you might get a lot of knockdowns before you get there. If we look at our health risk and productivity loss, you know, on, on what effect this has, and we always know that when we have a lot of health risks, you know, up to alcohol, tobacco, this is big business worrying about it now, driving, physical activity, our well-being, we know that we have a marked decrease in productivity. If we look at the mean annual cost and lost productivity each year, the more health risk we have, the more loss per productivity that we're going to have. What about how do we spend? You know, everybody thinks, well, doctors are making all of this money. 31% of healthcare dollars go to hospitals. Physicians only make at 21.4% of the healthcare dollars. Prescription drugs is 10%. Nursing home care is 5.9%. Home health, you know, that is 2.6%. Other personal health care, you know, like glasses, them, and then other health spending is 16.2%. So you can see that we really need to begin to look. We only spend 4%, 4% of all of our health care dollars on keeping people well. On public health, on, you know, on things that help to keep us well. And I think that that's where we're going to have to spend, begin to spend more money. So what are the health decisions that began to make good sense? We know that data drives decisions. You've heard about the importance of making sure we have a science-based decisions. Well, then we've got to design a system, and this is what we've not done, drives behavior. We've not educated our people to be healthy, and we know the delivery is dependent upon the health management skills. <coughs> and we get dividends once we do that. I've always felt very strongly that, well, let me, we mentioned the data drives the decisions that should be made. Why provide me with a whole lot of stop smoking to, uh, to be in, instituted in my company when nobody in my company smokes. You know, so, but then why don't you let me teach them how to take care of their diabetes or how to exercise or do other things to, if we want to cause major behavior changes to get the kind of dividends that we say that we want. Well, this is the projected cost of health care from 1980 up to 2010. So you see that line has been steadily going up. And, I, and we, so we can't afford that cost. Everybody tells us that we can't afford these high health care expenses. So the major problems with our health care system as we know it is, first of all, access. When we've got 47 million people who have no access, cost, cost too much, delivers too little. Quality. There are gross lapses in quality, you've heard, depending on where you live. If you live in the rural area, like in my hometown, there are 98 people in my hometown, 97 when I'm down here. So, <laughs> so, so you know, regardless of what. And then if we, don't, if we have people with, who, uh, you know, if you have people who need health care and they don't have transportation, I've said over and over, it's cheaper to train bus drivers than it is to train doctors. So we've got to find a way to get them into the healthcare system and get them there. We still have major disparities based on education, based on race, based on age, based on gender. Can you believe that if a woman is been, has been abused by her husband, our health insurances turn them down now? 
um, because, and then, you know, the many health insurances don't provide maternity care. So that means young women can't get health insurance. So we, we've got some real problems, you know, just based on gender. And of course, we've talked about, and you've heard the lack of transparency. Nobody in this room would go out and buy a brand new car that they've never seen or didn't know anything about or hadn't read anything about. But we all go to doctors. We all go to hospitals. We don't know one thing about what's the best hospital here in town. We all have a general idea. Or, well, you know, I'm just, I, well, let me say in Little Rock. Though. But, but you know, you'd come to Little Rock, you wouldn't know. There, and there's no way you can easily find out. There's no way you can easily find out who's absolutely the best doctor, where you're going to get the best value for your money. So I feel that we've got to make health care more transparent so we'll know. And then if we don't educate people so they'll know, even if we had it out there printed on the sheet on the wall, many of our people still wouldn't know. So these are defects that we've got to correct in our health care system if, if we're going to make a difference. So what are the recommendations, what would I recommend for the new health care system and not my recommendations that I copied them off of somebody else. But uh, <laughs> first of all, what we all want, our vision, is we want healthy people in healthy communities. We want a health care system that's available, that's accessible, affordable. It needs to be prevention focused. You know, we always talk about, you know, I'm always talking about reducing teenage pregnancy. Think of the billions of dollars teenage pregnancy costs. You know, they drop out of school, they're less well educated, they can't get jobs, and then the 70% of the young people that are in your prison this morning were born to teenage parents. So I'm saying, so it continues to cost. It needs to be purpose driven and solution oriented. We need to make sure that it's for a purpose. We've got to take some individual responsibility. But how can you be responsible if you don't know how? And we never taught our young people to have health education and how to take care of their own health. And many of them don't know. You fuss about them not eating right. Nobody ever taught them anything other than Big Macs. And Mr. McDonald spends, I don't know, $6 billion a year. And that's probably an exaggeration. Six, more than $6 million a year advertising his Big Macs and we don't teach health education in our schools. So we're part, of, we're part of the problem. Our health care professionals should be, have, we've got to center our system around making sure that we have a patient-centered health care system that we're going to, and it needs to be equitable for all. I very much support universal health I don't know whether it's insurance. I want all people to be able to get health care. And I don't, and what we've talked about is how we pay it. But we've got to talk about how do we deliver it. Because you could have all the best payers in the world if people don't know to go. We've got to have parity for both physical and mental health. We've mentioned gender equity. We've got to, it's got to be without high deductibles and high co-pays. And we've got to promote a diverse workforce. We've got to have more minorities out there going to medical schools and getting involved. Medical African Americans, we make up 12 to 13 percent of the population, and we're only three to four percent of the doctors, nurses, or dentists. We've got to get more minorities out there in the healthcare system. We've got to provide long term care for our disabled and those with disabilities and our elderly. We've got to do better data collection so we can make good decisions. If we don't have the data, we can't make decisions. I very much support health information technology. There are loads of technology out there that we've, we're, and we're beginning to access that an awful lot better and do a lot better with that. And we've talked about electronic medical records. And I do support electronic medical records. 
and whether they reduce health care costs. In fact, I think they've shown that they might reduce health care costs. But then they make the doctor, when it pops up that I need my flu shot, at least he'll remember to give it. <laughs> so what are some of the strategies that we've got to deal with? The most important, education, education, education. If we don't educate our society, we can never get them healthy. We've got to have some access strategies. How do we deliver a, to, and make sure that people will have access to care? And it's more than just money. Prevention, we've got to have some prevention strategies, some intervention strategies. We've got to be compassionate. You know, I want to make sure we have health care for me and my friend and my next door neighbor, but I don't worry about the rest of the world. And we've got to start worrying about the rest of the world. We've got to continue to do high quality research. And we've got to have some political strategies. We've got to have more doctors involved in health care reform. We've got loads of lawyers, but we've left our decision and what we're going to do, we've left it to the economists to the lawyers and everybody else. We've got to get up and get involved rather than just sitting around complaining. And let me talk about the last, I see Kevin's descending out, but let me just say, let me mention some leadership strategies. We're talking about the five C's of leadership that we doctors have got to get involved in. The first is clarity of vision. We say we want health care reform. We've got to decide what we want. If you talk with us, you've got, probably got as many decisions as you've got, we've got people in the United States when we talk about what it is exactly that we want. We've got to be consistent. We're competent. I feel that we're competent, but we are not competent to make, we aren't making the competent decisions about how do we deliver high quality health care for all of our people. We've got to be committed. What are the three C's of commitment? We've got to give of our time, our talent, and our treasures. We've got to dig down in our pocketbooks and give up a few treasures sometime. And last but not least, I feel that we as healthcare providers must be involved in deciding the control of how healthcare is controlled. And I feel that we've not done that. So as I close, I'll tell you a joke it's what my bishop told me. It's not really a joke. But he said, Dr. Elders, you'll have to always remember uh, that in the job you're in, it's like dancing with a bear. He says, when you're dancing with a bear, you can't get tired and sit down. So I want you to know that we've been dancing with this health care reform strategy since 19... Oh, wait. Well, we've got to keep on dancing until that old bear gets tired so we can sit down. Thank you very much. Thank you.